Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to the third episode of Gardeners of the Galaxy, a new podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I am Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. It's an exciting show this week because I will be talking to a guest a little bit later on and exploring the topic of houseplants in space. Before we get to that, there's been plenty of interesting news for space gardeners. Researchers have found that lava tubes on the Moon and Mars are likely to be much, much wider than the ones that form on Earth. This means that there will be plenty of space to build habitats that will be sheltered from radiation and the inhospitable conditions on the surface. It's a theoretical study, and I will put a link in the show notes for you. It's introduced me to a great new word. Apparently lava tubes are called pyroducts. And there won't be a shortage of building materials to make use of all that space. A team of researchers from India has developed a process for making bricks from lunar soil, bacteria and guar gum. Guar gum is extracted from guar beans, Cyamopsis tetragonaloba, which have been cultivated in South Asia for centuries. Guar gum is used quite a lot as a food additive, particularly in gluten-free foods. And using guar gum instead of cement gives bricks a lower carbon footprint, which may not be a concern on the moon, but could make building more sustainable on Earth. And speaking of sustainability, Professor Daniel Ye at the University of South Florida has been collaborating with NASA to develop a system that converts human waste into fertiliser and water, which would allow astronauts to grow fresh vegetables in space in a more sustainable way. His invention, which is called the Organic Processor Assembly, is being sent to Kennedy Space Center this month for testing under simulated space mission conditions. During the test, the unit will be fed with synthetic wastewater to mimic the output of a crew of four astronauts. The nutrients will be processed into fertiliser through an algae bioreactor. Retired science teacher Danny Jacques has developed a new space food recipe to tingle astronauts' taste buds. He has recreated his family recipe for salsa with freeze-dried ingredients. Danny's Rocket Ranch Space Salsa is medium heat, but Martian Mild and Martian Hot versions are in development. Danny hopes his recipe will catch NASA's eye, but in the meantime he's selling it online, and a portion of the sales will go to support sending kids to space camp. Taiwan will be sending seeds to the International Space Station this October as part of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's Space Seeds for Asian Future program. Nine nations are participating in this launch, with 16 varieties of seeds expected to blast off. Taiwan has chosen to send seeds from chili pepper, sunflowers, formosa lambs quarters and phalaenopsis equestris. That's a kind of butterfly orchid originating from Lesser Orchid Island. The Formosa lambs quarters are Chenopodium formosanum, Taiwan's indigenous species of quinoa. Thailand and Australia have both decided to send the seeds of their national flowers, the Rachafruek and the Golden Wattle respectively. New Zealand is sending the seeds of the Pahutukawa, an endemic plant. Indonesia is sending celery and onion seeds and Malaysia the seed of holy basil. The seeds are all scheduled to return to Earth in February, then they'll be sent back to their country of origin and planted to see whether they have been affected by their space adventure. The Canadian Space Agency is hoping that a four-year greenhouse project in western Nunavut will point the way to growing vegetables for future space travellers. With short, cloudy summers and dark, frigid winters, the area isn't a paradise for plants. However, it shares a lot of similarities with the harsh and cold environments of outer space. The greenhouse will be built inside a sea can, which seems to be Canadian for shipping container. The project is called Narvik, which means the growing place in Inuinaktun, an indigenous Inuit language. And I'm just going to pause here to apologise for what I am sure was sucky pronunciation of words in unfamiliar languages. And if you're worried you'd get bored on the long space flight to Mars, then you'll be pleased to hear that Arctic squirrels may hold the key to putting humans into hibernation. If you'd like to know more about that research, you should listen to a recent edition of the Wild Bites podcast. I'll put the link to that in the show notes for you. As I said earlier, in this episode I'm going to be talking about houseplants in space, a topic which arose from two different articles I found during the course of my research. The first article is by Sam Coppard, and I was lucky enough to be able to speak to Sam about it last week. Hi Sam, thanks for joining us on Gardeners of the Galaxy. Oh, it's great to be here. 
you are here to talk about an article you wrote about this time last year that I found interesting. You were talking about how many house plants would be required to provide enough oxygen for one person. And you used as your example an astronaut called Lucy, who is unfortunately, for some reason, trapped in a fairly <laughs> small room. And she's going to be dependent on these plants for her oxygen supply. So first off, can I ask you why you decided to write about that particular particular topic? Uh, it's probably a less exciting answer than you're after. <laughs> um, so my job at the time, I was working for a company called Candide, which is a gardening app. Um, and my job was basically to grow the app to get more people using it um, in ways where you don't have to pay people to use it. Uh, so it's called organic growth, which yeah. has got all the puns for gardening. <laughs> it's a real treasure trove in there. And so one of the ways that you do that is by writing things that you think other people will link to so that then your website appears higher in the search engines. Right. Um, so that was the idea behind this, basically. It was, I was searching around for questions around gardens, plants, anything like that, that I couldn't find a satisfactory answer to that I thought people might be interested in. Oh. Um, expecting to then, if I wrote it well, become kind of like the go-to resource for other people <laughs> asking that particularly like niche question. Um, and, and yeah, I just kind of stumbled across this topic, didn't think anyone had done it very well, or I wasn't happy with the answers that they'd come up with and could keep poking lots of holes in. And I'm sure you can poke holes in mine as well. But yeah, that's essentially where it came from. Just an interesting question or interesting things in my mind um, that I didn't think anyone had answered very well. Ah, okay. Uh, did you, have you had any feedback on the article? Did you get, did you get a lot of interest from gardeners? Um, on that front, it was a, a failed experiment, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, it's captured me. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. Not not a complete waste of time, clearly. Um, it, it got quite a lot of interest on the app itself. Uh, I think at the time it was, it got kind of more likes than most articles did. Right. But in terms of generating links, uh, yeah, it's quite unsuccessful. A lot of what I was doing was kind of experimenting. experimenting. You find, yeah. you try lots of different things, and if one of them works, then you double down on that for a while, and then try and find something else. So this was one of many experiments, and not one that worked for that, but I had a lot of fun writing it. So, <laughs> I bet you um, did. Got paid to have fun, essentially. <laughs> So, I mean, you quite literally did the maths. Have you got a maths background? Yeah, that was my degree. Oh, so, okay. So it yeah, wasn't so too much of a stretch. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of combining my background with my current job. There aren't probably that many people who kind of combine maths and gardening. No. no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was a good way to kind of get a unique angle, I think. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. So, I mean, I won't ruin it for everybody because I'll, I'll, I'll let them go off and read the article for itself. But, I mean, were you surprised by how the answer turned out? Yeah, it turns out you need a lot more plants to keep you alive than I expected. <laughs> uh, you, you always hear about, you know, have the right plants in your bedroom and you'll sleep better, it'll yeah. remove all the impurities from the air, all that kind of thing. It turns out it's a load of rubbish. Yeah. Um, it's, it kind of works just about in a lab setting, in like a hermetically sealed room with no inflow, no outflow. But it turns out just a normal room with mm. the tiny little gaps around windows Not and the so doors, much. drafts, and certainly if you've got a window open, the, the impact that a plant has is negligible next to anything else. So, you know, you can stack your room full of, you know, 50 piece lilies, and it's not really going to make any difference at all. I mean, it, you know, it'll nice. look nice <laughs> yeah. and you might feel better. But yeah, but I'd never really looked into that before. It just kind of came up when I was researching this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was expecting, you know, maybe a few dozen plants would keep would you alive. Yeah. Just enough oxygen. But yeah, way off. Uh, so do you think space is a topic that you will return to in the future? And space gardening? Um, it is pretty niche, to be fair. Um <laughs> I think NASA did a bunch of studies back in, well, I don't know, maybe the 70s, basically trying to find out um, which plants you should put on a spaceship yeah. to keep the air clean, that kind of thing, which is where most of the most of the articles and things that reference these air purifying plants draw it from this NASA study. But their conclusion essentially was that while some plants are better out than others, none of them are good enough, Yeah. Uh, which is why, you know, the International Space Station isn't a forest. Um <laughs> So, yeah, I don't really know. I mean, it would certainly be like a cool job if you managed to 
do some kind of space gardening job, but I don't really know how that would realistically ever be a thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there are um, other countries that are doing more research on the subject. There was uh, okay. some Japanese experiments that involved um, putting people into essentially a greenhouse with some pygmy goats. So that was an interesting one. And I think the Russians have done a fair amount, but of course the Russians are a little bit more secretive about this, so it's not quite yeah. as easy to tell. Uh, <laughs> I guess there's, so, al- there's always a chance that uh, someone might get stranded on Mars. Yeah. Like, um, What's the Matt Damon film? <laughs> the Martian, yes. The Martian, yeah. You'd be hoping for a little bit more to eat than potatoes, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. And there were some Chinese studies where they they shut um, some students, I think, in in a greenhouse and they were eating lots of soybeans and things like that. So it is still ongoing, but I don't think it's something that NASA is particularly interested in at this point in time. Okay. So I wanted to ask you a question, which I'm going to ask everybody, cool. which is if you were going to be joining a space colony on Mars or the moon, what plant would you take with you and why? Mm, okay. Um, I guess space is probably, as in the physical space that you've got, the amount of room, it's probably going to be quite a limiting factor. So in that yeah. case, I'd, I'd probably go something, a nice, happy house plant that there is no chance of me killing. <laughs> something more fun than a cactus, because while you can't really kill them, they're pretty boring in my opinion. Yeah. But if you have something like a really fussy orchid and it died... That would be quite sad if you're on Mars and it's not a whole lot of life. No. Uh, I mentioned Peacedies earlier. Maybe Peacedies is a good one. Or a fern. I quite like ferns. Yeah, ferns are always good. Yes. And they do that wavy thing in the air move. So, yeah. yeah, it's nice. Yeah. 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 If, if space wasn't an issue, get a tree. <laughs> I think a tree would be pretty nice. First tree on Mars. Oh, it would be pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Aim high. <laughs> yeah. Mm, that'd be interesting. Have you seen um, there's a, a tree... In, I think it's maybe Utah, I'm not certain, um, but it's uh, an aspen. It's the largest tree in the world. It basically just keeps throwing oh, yes. itself underground. It's yeah. called Pando. And it's something something like 100 acres. And it's actually <laughs> all just one tree that looks like 40,000 trees. So I guess if you just had one plant and space miraculously <laughs> wasn't an issue, that'd be You'd the take dream. that. <laughs> you basically take a whole forest. <laughs> Is that cheating? No, I suppose technically Probably it's not. Cheating, but, uh, <laughs> I'm going with it. <laughs> no, okay, good choice. We'll let you have Pando then. Yes, the the clone, self-cloning Aspen. Okay, yeah, interesting. So I'm just absolutely fascinated by what people would choose and also the way that they go about choosing. That absolutely fascinating. So would you like to go to space? Yeah, for sure. Yeah? Um, <laughs> what about Mars? I mean, I'd love to go to Mars, but it's quite a hefty trip. It is. You know, assuming we can do it one day. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what the numbers are, but it's a few years, I think. Uh, I think it's, it's sort of six to... months there and six months back, and you've got to stay long enough to make it worthwhile. So, yeah, yeah. 18 and months to a year. Yeah, and there's a thing with like, the, the orbit's not being fully in sync, so you have every to wait until the of closest years. point. Yeah, yeah, every 26 months is when the orbits align. Yeah, yeah so you end up with like, a two- or three-year trip, which yeah. is pretty hefty to not be on Earth. I guess if it was... I'd certainly go up to like the ISS yeah. or, yeah, just an orbital flight. If that were ever kind of within the realms of most people. Maybe down the line. Okay. Yeah, there's a chance. Give it a few decades. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on the show and talking about your wonderful article. I will put a link to that in the show notes for everybody so they can go and read and see exactly what it takes to keep Lucy alive in her, <laughs> in her little enclosed room and her house plants. Um, I think she's going to be doing a little bit of watering. I should say the astronaut was called Lucy uh, because... She's one of my best friends, so I ah. have to be messaging at the time that I started writing the article. So like, cool, I'll use her name. Um, <laughs> and as I went on with the article, it looked less and less promising for Lucy. Oh, dear. Um, I think by the end of it, when I showed it to her, she was uh, a little bit upset that I was basically finding ways to make her die in space. Okay, that's not it. A... <laughs> <laughs> that's a less fun way of looking at it. <laughs> I, say, I would say that you were going all out for her survival. You know, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. spin it that way. Yeah. yeah, if she but, listens to this, that's, that's what we'll go with. Uh, yeah, Lucy, there were a lot of challenges, but he, <laughs> he took them all into account and managed to keep you alive. So I I've think... got faith in her. She'll, she'll work something out. She'll be fine. Yeah, she will science the sh out of it, as, <laughs> as Matt Damon would say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Sam, well, thank you very much for taking thank the time you. to uh, come on the podcast, and I wish you all the best for the future. Cheers. Sam's article was how many plants would it take to produce enough oxygen for one person? It was a thought experiment, but it reminded me of a practical experiment I saw a few years ago. 
In the 18th century, a scientist called Joseph Priestley demonstrated that although a mouse enclosed in an airtight container would quickly suffocate, it would survive in a container filled with plants. Priestley chose mint plants for these famous bell jar experiments, from which he observed that plants release oxygen by the process we now know as photosynthesis. Priestley is credited with the discovery of oxygen, although there are a couple of other scientists who also have strong claims. Priestley was obviously good with gases. When James Cook made his second voyage to the South Seas, Priestley provided the crew with a method for making carbonated water. He mistakenly thought that this would prevent them from being affected by scurvy. Now, Priestley never patented his carbonation technique. If he had, he would have made millions. His consolation prize is to go down in history as the father of soft drinks. Now, in 2011, Priestley's bell jar experiment was recreated on a grand scale at the Eden Project in Cornwall. I'm sure you've seen pictures of the Eden Project, with its magnificent biome settling like bubbles into a former clay mine. It's one of my favourite places on Earth, dedicated to plants and the important roles they play in our biosphere. It has three separate biomes, the temperate biome outside and Mediterranean and tropical climates in the domes. The experiment took place in the tropical biome, in the hot and humid environment of a rainforest. Ian Stewart is Professor of Geoscience Communication at the University of Plymouth and a TV presenter. In 2011, he worked on a short series for BBC Two called How to Grow a Planet. For the show, he spent 48 hours inside a sealed box, relying on plants to produce his oxygen and remove excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The container was 12 square metres and see-through so that visitors to the Eden Project could observe the action, or lack thereof. Ian had a hammock, a laptop, an exercise bike and a small chemical toilet. The plants had specialist lighting to ensure they had everything they needed to photosynthesise. In fact, the exercise bike was partly for them too. If carbon dioxide levels in the chamber dropped too low, Ian had to exercise and exhale some more for them. Between 150 and 200 plants were grown at the Eden Project for the experiment, including miscanthus, banana plants, maize and a mix of tropical herbs. The species were chosen because they have a quicker rate of photosynthesis and would produce the right amount of oxygen. The experiment was closely monitored to ensure no harm befell Ian, or the plants. The temperature and humidity were kept at optimal levels for the plants, which meant Ian was probably a bit warm and sweaty. He said he spent most of his time watering the plants to keep them alive. Well, you would, wouldn't you? At the beginning of the experiment, the oxygen levels inside the chamber were reduced to about half normal levels, equivalent to the amount of oxygen you'd find at an altitude of 4,500 metres. Professor Stewart said that at first he thought he'd be gasping for breath, but it wasn't like that, although he did have blinding headaches and was very tired. Dr Daniel Martin from the Royal Free Hospital was one of the specialists monitoring the experiment. He later said that the team could see Ian's condition improving over the 48 hours. By the end of the test, the oxygen levels inside the chamber had almost returned to normal. If you'd like to know more, then the research was published in an open access scientific paper in 2012. The title of that is A Paradigm of Fragile Earth in Priestley's Bell Jar, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes for you. How to Grow a Planet is available to buy on DVD or to stream via Amazon Prime, and I'll give you those links as well. The second article I mentioned is called When We All Move to Space, We'll Have to Be Picky About Houseplants. It appeared on Atlas Obscura, which I am now struggling not to call Astro Obscura. I'm sure they'll get around to having a dedicated space section in due course. Anyway, this article was written by Jessica Lee Hester in April 2019. It begins by describing a plant kept alive in an analogue habitat. At the Johnson Space Centre, NASA has a three-storey closed habitat designed to serve as an analogue for isolation, confinement and remote conditions in exploration scenarios. It's called the Human Exploration Research Analogue, or HERA, and small groups of people are shut inside for weeks at a time so that we can learn more about what it would be like to participate in a long-duration space mission. In January 2016, Lachelle Spencer was one of four women who participated in HERA 9. Spencer is a NASA scientist working on growing food in space and air and water purification on the International Space Station. The group spent a month simulating the isolation of flight operations involved in a mission to a near-Earth asteroid. One of the things Spencer was involved in during her analogue mission was an educational outreach project involving lima beans. At the end of the project, she had a spindly little lima bean sprouting in a plastic bag, which she was supposed to destroy. But she couldn't do it. Instead, she named it Alfred and hid it where the cameras couldn't see the crew tending the plant. She says the team loved Alfred and made him a mascot. They turned Alfred into a house plant. Confined in a grey, white and stainless steel habitat, they gravitated towards the growing green plant. 
Most space plant experiments so far have focused on fundamental plant science or on growing useful crops, but given the known psychological benefits of having plants around, could there be a place for purely ornamental houseplants in space? Many of the problems we have growing plants in space revolve around how to handle watering in microgravity. Plants that require less water, such as succulents, may therefore be good choices. They'll also have to thrive on neglect, as astronauts are busy people with many demands on their time. Spencer thinks that a philodendron would work well. She says she has one at home that is often neglected, but still alive. Joya Massa is the lead on NASA's veggie project which grows edible salad plants on the International Space Station. She thinks houseplants may be easier to grow because they are more tolerant of lower light levels. Slow growth would be an advantage too, as you don't want your houseplant rapidly outgrowing the space available or needing constant pruning. In the article, Massa makes an interesting point about the zinnias, astronaut Scott Kelly famously nurtured to full bloom on the International Space Station. Zinnias were chosen over similar flowers, such as petunias, because they don't drop their petals. In microgravity, floating debris can cause eye injuries and clog up air filters, so houseplants that shed pollen would also be a problem. Spencer goes on to suggest that aloe vera might be a perfect choice. A small succulent that requires little care or water, it's pleasing to the eye but it comes with a bonus because it can be used to make a soothing salve for skin that's cracking up in the low humidity environment. An aloe would certainly have more chance of thriving than poor Alfred the lima bean. He didn't make it to the end of the mission. There's only so much growing a little sprout can do in a plastic bag and wet tissue paper. So whichever houseplants future astronauts decide to take on their missions, they'd better remember to pack pots and compost. Earlier on, you heard Sam's answer to my fantasy space plants question, which is, if you were joining a settlement on Mars or the Moon, which plant would you take with you and why? If you'd like to share your answer to that question, you can record it and I'll include it in the show. Or you can just write it down and email it to earth at spacebotany.uk and I can read it out for you. That's it for this episode. Don't forget that I have chilli seeds from Victoriana Nursery Gardens to give away to two lucky listeners. If you have a UK mailing address, just drop an email to earth at spacebotany.uk and let me know if you'd have a preference for cool chillies or spicier ones. The deadline for entries is 31st of August 2020, after which Mission Control will pick the winners' names out of the space helmet. You'll find the show notes and lots more information on growing plants on Earth and beyond on my website, theunconventionalgardener.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at orbitalgardens. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control, confirming termination of your signal. We have activated the auto kettle and you are T minus three minutes. Mission Control out.